Now this evening, we have announced to speak on the theme, The Great Apostasy. Would you turn, please, to Second Thessalonians, chapter 2. The English word apostasy does not occur in the New Testament, but in the third verse, the word falling away is a translation of the very word from which we get our word apostasy. So we find our text residing in this chapter, which I shall read for you. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that ma that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that, when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and know ye what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hindereth will hinder, or preventeth will prevent, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the teachings, the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God even our Father, which hath loved us and given us everlasting consolation, and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts, and establish you in every good word and work. This is a tremendous portion of scripture, and one that has through the centuries led to a great deal of speculation. For if you will read the writings about the time that Paul wrote, you will find that they were attributing the man of sin to Nero and Diocletian, and then others of the those who persecuted the church. And it's carried on until the present. I remember some years ago when they were finding in our newspapers the ones who identified with this man of sin. And so we are not prone to speculation. I believe that uh, it's uh, wrong for us to do that because more often than not we are wrong when we have identified some particular individual with the scripture. The scripture gives us principles, and when we understand these principles and see them, then we are able to uh, understand what's taking place in our newspaper. It makes, uh, it, has, it makes sense. We, we can realize that whereas the personalities will change, the stream is flowing in a given direction. So I'm not proposing at all this evening to try and identify the details of this portion with the uh, day in which we live. I am particularly concerned about this third verse. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The part of importance to us today is the falling away. As Paul wrote, it had not yet taken place. We would like to think at times that uh, the scripture were written directed toward our day and toward our time, but remember that this was written about 54 A.D., some 24 years after the ascension of Christ. By that time, Paul could say that there had not been an apostasy. 
of falling away from the simplicity of the gospel. Oh, there had been corruptors that had tried to get in, Judaizers that had tried to bring them back to legalistic observance. There had been those that brought Gnostic heresy in. But this was not called the apostasy, the falling away. That had not occurred, according to this text, by the time Paul wrote. Or else this, of course, would have been irrelevant. What is this great, great apostasy? Has it happened? Or is it yet to happen? We will see it in three different lights. First, individuals have apostatized. We recognize that this falling away is more than just a being overtaken in temptation or falling into sin. It has reference to a complete return or turning back a tent. I think the scripture would uh, have us see this word used in the connotation of a deliberate revolt against the government of Christ. Repentance, as you understand, is an open and complete break with the past in the government of Satan. It's a renunciation of Satan's rule in the life and a commitment to Christ, a receiving of Christ as he is presented as a prince and as a savior. Therefore, falling away, as it's understood in the scripture, would be re the reverse of repentance, a re-repentance or a changing of a mind back again to what it was. A complete re-changing of the mind. Now we understand that a child of God can be overtaken in a fall, led aside by appetite, and fall into sin. This book does not teach a state of grace where that one will attain where he cannot be tempted. We've heard in the past criticisms of teachers of sinless perfection. I have yet to find anyone that uh, teaches what we usually uh, see attributed to them. Uh, most of my friends uh, that would be in such a camp would be the first to repudiate it. But I understand from the fact that there's so much smoke somewhere along the line, there must have been some fire, and someone went beyond the scripture and said he couldn't sin. So we'll allow that as a possibility. But the scripture does add that there are those that hold it, not a scriptural possibility. But the, the scripture does not so teach that there is any state of grace where one cannot sin. But it does teach that God gives victory in temptation and enables one to have the life of Christ made manifest in him, delivering him at the time of temptation, enabling him thus to stand. But we, whereas this is true, we also recognize that a Christian can sin. Someone whose face is headed toward the New Jerusalem, having the cross current blow catch the sails and, and uh, drive the ship off course, can cause that individual to sin. And of course, sin is sin. And it has to be dealt with. The scripture says, do your first works again. And this includes judging it to be sin, forsaking it as sin, confessing it as sin, and knowing the cleansing of the blood of Christ. And when one does choose to disobey the Lord, there is, of course, uh, sin in every sense of the word. Not to the destruction of the soul, but certainly to the grief of the Lord and of the individual. And so the Bible teaches that there is this possibility of a child of God sinning. But this is in contrast to personal apostasy. I do believe that Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 teach the possibility of a deliberate apostasy. Now, I didn't used to believe this. I would have said years ago that uh, this was impossible. But the Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 are there. I've collected innumerable books that expound it and take away the sharp edge from it. But after I've read the involved and sometimes intricate the explanations that take the edge off of these chapters, I go back and the chapters are still there and the edge has not been changed and they stand as a dire warning to anyone. And anyone that would try to minimize them and just to make light of them is certainly doing harm to his own soul and uh, being dishonest with the people that might listen to such. Now Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 remain in the Word and they're there and they're terrifying and they ought to be. And when the scripture says serve God, to serve with godly fear and reverence, this is exactly what it means. For I personally hold to and believe that there is the possibility of apostasy, where one can come to that place where he deliberately turns his back upon Christ, he turns his back upon the truth, and commits himself to a life of rebellion. Now Hebrews 6 says something like this, that if one deliberately sins, there is no place found for repentance in him. It didn't say that if he repented, he wouldn't be forgiven. But something happens to the human spirit and he doesn't want to repent. I've told you about that individual 
the former pastor, and one whom I met some frequently for some years that would be in services, especially down at uh, uh, Washington, D.C. and elsewhere in Delaware and Maryland and uh, southern uh, round Philadelphia when I'd be ministering, I'd see him. He'd come in and he'd be there in the service and several times tears would stream down his cheeks as I'd be preaching and I'd go to him afterwards where he always spoke to me and I'd say, why were you weeping tonight? And his answer invariably would be something like this. I'm weeping because I have no heart whatever to repent. I'm weeping because my heart is so hard. I don't want to change. And this is the thing that makes my tears come. He wasn't repenting and finding that he wasn't being forgiven. He was weeping because of the fact his heart had become so hard. No place found for repentance in him. So let's just accept then, you search the scriptures on the point, that there is the possibility of personal apostasy. That one can, uh, having had some state of grace, who knows what it was, I'm not prepared to say. Someone said, well, he wasn't saved in the first place then. Well, this is, to my mind, a begging of the question, because he had a testimony and was accepted for the testimony. And as far as I'm concerned, that we will see that the Scripture does teach that personal apostasy. We have the script, one of the cases in history was the Julian the Apostate, one of the uh, associates of, uh, of the early church fathers. He was given the opportunity, because of his being related to the emperor, uh, becoming the emperor of Rome. And he renounced Christ, took up his uh, place as, a, as a, the head of the state religion of idolatry, and be absolutely repudiated all of his connections with the Christians and his dependence upon the Lord. He was engaged in battle. He was mortally wounded by a sword thrust. And tradition tells us that as he fallen to the ground, he reached down and took the, the sand that had been moistened with his own blood, squeezed it between his fingers, and there he saw in the sky a vision of the cross. And he flung the sand and blood at the vision in the sky and cried out, O thou Galilean, thou hast conquered at last. Julian the apostate, one that had walked with the children of God before gain, had turned his back. We know that Demas had forsaken Paul and forsaken the church, having loved this present world. So let's allow that there is this possibility. Not become involved and down in the well, what the state was. I, I, as far as I'm concerned, let's accept it that they had some testimony and they've done it. Now, when a child of God falls into sin and temptation, there's a difference between that and this kind of final and uh, uh, unchangeable apostasy. And unchangeable, I say, because of the heart of the individual. Then we recognize a second kind of apostasy or falling away. And this we will have reference to a doctrinal uh, corruption. This takes place wherever truth is intellectually held without being inwardly experienced. Let me say it again. Wherever truth, Bible truth, is viewed simply objectively and held intellectually without having been inwardly experienced, you have the gradual erosion and the, the decline, the gravitational pull that's going to change that. For if you will study the history of of uh, the church going back to the Greek Orthodox and the Syrian Orthodox and to the Roman Catholic, you will find that uh, there was a time when truths were vitally real. Then to one generation they were not real and so they attached a, a ceremony, a symbol, a form. And gradually there was this evolvement of ritual and ceremony and symbolism that took the place of reality before the stations of the cross are an excellent picture of our identification with Christ. And many times individuals in that context that have found the Lord Jesus begin to see the meaning, and it has some little measure of life to them. But there's this falling away from the vitality, there's this falling away from the reality of truth. Now this could be happening in your life, and we're certainly not equating this with the great apostasy in that sense in which the scripture sets it forth. It is a process that takes place in any mind or in any group of people whenever they allow truth to be objectively held without being inwardly experienced. It takes place on the mission field. You find the missionaries going to a tribe of savages, headhunters, cannibals perhaps, living in gross worship of Satan, and as the gospel is preached, there's a complete change from vile black to white. But these are Christians now, and so they have a Christian home. They've given up all these vile practices. 
Their bodies may have the marks made by the witch doctor or in the evil practices of their uh, heathen religion, but their hearts have been cleansed and their minds have been enlightened. So their children grow up in a Christian home. And a Christian home is a Christian home in anywhere, regardless of where you are. So these children have acquired the idea that they're not quite as bad as their cannibal fathers were. They grow up, but there's some reality, because father had such a transforming experience, such a glorious experience, that the boys get the reflected light, and the little girls see something so different in their mothers in contrast with the mothers around them. But they have less of reality, and sometimes there's just a form of godliness, just the doctrine, just the plan. And the little girls then marry Christian boys, and the boys marry Christian uh, uh, women, and there's the third generation. And so frequently you find that in that third generation, things which were vitally real to grandfather are just uh, so-so to the grandchildren. And it's a strong movement, a religious Christian movement that can live past the third generation and hold its vitality because of this falling away, this eroding of reality. If it could be that every generation all the churches fell down and all the organizations disintegrated and all the groups just disappeared and everybody had to start all over again, there might be some preservation of reality. But as it is, there's this continuous erosion, doctrinal erosion, practice, uh, devotional life. It's just going on around us constantly and it's going on in my home, it's going on in your home. We have to be constantly alert to it continuously re resisting it and seeking to have our everyone we touch and meet not brought into a formula but brought into a vital relationship with the living Christ because it's just so easy for them to go through a little ritual and miss him and then years later they stumble over this fact because as they come under the real tests and pressures of life they found that it wasn't real and so they just give it up. And this, I say, behooves us to recognize that this eroding, this uh, ritualizing, is a continuous thing. I put it this way. Whenever you do anything in your Christian life today, just because you did it yesterday and because you don't want to break your record, you've already started to make your own rosary, whether you have beads or not. Whether it's saying the blessing, whether it's your quiet time, whether it's reading the scripture, you say, well, isn't it valuable? Yes, it's valuable. It's certainly better than not doing it at all. But it's infinitely better that it should be done with vitality and done with reality, lest you should be eroding your life and you should be just sort of enduring. You know, the scalpel that can cut if it's properly wielded it can also callous if it's just lightly scraped across the skin. And you take that scalpel that's designed to make a deep incision and remove the malignancy and just rub it in such a way that it doesn't actually cut and you'll soon callous. And so there is this aspect of apostasy, the eroding of reality and the eroding and the washing away of vitality in the life of a group or the life of a church. We see history filled with this. But this is not the apostasy of which the scripture speaks. What is it? Does it have reference to some great invasion such as took place a hundred years ago and the effect of which continues until the present hour? When we had the uh, impact of science, falsely so-called in my estimation, carrying over into the church, and the inspiration of the Bible was, uh, was brought into question, when the principles of evolution of, that were then being propounded to uh, nature were extended over to the Bible and it was said to be simply the gropings of uh, uh, primitive pastoral people across the century and did not represent the revelation of God. This attack that struck at the very foundation of our faith, that divided Christianity over liberalism and fundamentalism, is this the apostasy, the great falling away? Well, it could be in some sense perhaps viewed it. There's certainly been nothing quite as blatant and quite as overt as what's transpired in the last hundred years. But my feeling personally would be that it, this is not what we're referring to. I think it's more subtle than this, and I think perhaps it's even far older than this. I would suggest to you that the great apostasy that we have set forth here, this falling away that has not yet occurred, it took place far earlier than 1850. It probably was beginning in 100 years after Christ and uh, was quite uh, noticeable by uh, 313, the time that the church was recognized by the state and Christianity became state religion. May I put it this way, that the actual apostasy in my mind is 
the worshiping around a creed instead of a person. Put it in terms that you can grasp, that something happened very tragic back uh, 1,500 years ago, 1,600 years ago, when men lost sight of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and began to meet around a creed. Now, creeds are important, and I recognize that. But I also think that something terribly disastrous has taken place because there is the effect of a continuous extension of any creed. The moment that you accept a creed as the foundation of fellowship, and you take out 5, 10, 15, 20 statements from this book, and you hold those 20 statements up and say, we're meeting on the foundation of these 20 statements. Literally, what you've said is this. Nothing is important but these 20. And all the rest that the word has isn't as important as that. Well, where are you going to pick out something that isn't important in this book? What is it that God has said that isn't important? And so I would say that the falling away, the great apostasy, took place back in centuries gone by when men con were content to meet around a creed instead of a person. Because there's something so deadening, something so destructive to human or to spiritual life and vitality that it could almost be said to be Satan's grand masterpiece and strategy for having impoverished and weakened and divided the church. Today we have 312 groups known and recognized and registered with the government. 312 so-called denominations. And if you take the number of independent churches or one or two, you probably will get it up nearer to 500 or 600, you name it, whatever it would be. But nevertheless, we have seen this continuous fragmentation of the body of Christ, and it's been on the basis of creeds. Oftentimes, it's been personalities that have differed and clashed, and they've simply tried to dignify, rather than having it a personality squabble and trying to I'll come right out honestly and say it's vanity and ambition that's led to it, they've had to find some place where they differed, and then they'd get a doctrinal or a biblical basis, and this would be it. But if the truth were known, it was probably that somebody wanted to be the Duke of Goatville instead of what he thought he was, the goat of, the, the goat of Dukeville. And so he found a biblical basis for this, and he could uh, make a division then and with the dignity and with some degree of, uh, of uh, approbation of the general public. He was fighting a good fight of faith. And so we've had this fragmentation. 666, someone said, the man of sin, the number of the man of sin, of the divisions that have come over doctrinal differences. Now, the, the tragedy of this is that the moment that you assemble around a statement of doctrine, anyone that agrees with that doctrine is thereby eligible to participate in that assembly. Because you've advertised to the world that the basis of assembly is on a doctrinal statement. And you can recognize that it wouldn't be long then that if a clever evil genius such as Satan were trying to rob the church of power, that he would soon get people in to support the doctrine who had no experience even of that fragment of the doctrine. So then it would be doubly, doubly poisoned, having divided from all the others over a point of doctrine then to have been infiltrated by people that hadn't even experienced that much of the biblical statement and of the truth of the doctrine that they, on which they met in fellowship. And so we find this strategy has continued down across the centuries, and it has been so eminently successful until today we have this place where the church is not split, it's actually splintered. It's like a bundle of toothpicks scattered on every hand. And it's been going on across the centuries. Now, I could spend a good bit of time uh, on this, but I think it's preferable that we should move on and see what else accompanied this, this uh, great apostasy, if you're prepared to think with me. At least it'll, I trust, stimulate you. The second aspect of it was that we now had to have, and I'm thinking back 1,600 years ago, we then had to have priestly interpreters to help keep us on the doctrinal rail. You understand that if your fellowship is not with a risen Christ, but it's with a portion of Scripture, then you've got to have somebody there to sort of as an engineer to keep you from getting off, because along the way somewhere, you might meet someone that loved the Lord Jesus Christ and had a, a real warm, vital relationship with him, but didn't have to cross the, the T and dot the I the same way, and so you need someone 
to warn you as to who the ones with whom you're to have fellowship. And so we find developing at that same time the idea of the clergy as over against the laity. And this, I believe, is that which uh, uh, the Lord said he hated when he spoke of the Nicolaitans, and the error and the falsehood of the Nicolaitans, the idea that we could hire somebody to do for the body of Christ what the risen Christ by the Holy Spirit wanted to do through every member of his body. And that this is the second great uh, strategic attack of hell that was so eminently successful in achieving this goal of impoverishing the church of Jesus Christ. If we understand this book at all, it teaches that God has no stepchildren, that what he has done for one, he willingly does for all, and he's quite willing to give any relationship to you that he's given to anyone in the past if you're prepared to meet his terms and in the, in the context of his will and purpose for your life. So this thought that we could hire somebody to do for us what the Spirit of God wanted every member of the body of Christ to contribute to the health and the welfare and the blessing of the whole body of Christ or the, the curse of the Nicolaitans has been the second great uh, successful attack on the church of Jesus Christ. Now see the effect of it. Here is a uh, division over something that's extracted from the Word. Instead of taking the Bible as the rule of faith and life, and we meet, uh, gather to the Lord Jesus Christ and see him exalted and risen, and in the uh, midst is the one whom we worship, that we gather not to uh, uh, some fragment of truth, but to the person who himself is the truth. What is the contrast? What has actually happened? Well, we find that here are the Presbyterians, and they have taken the sovereignty of God. And this is a truth that's very precious to their hearts. Over here are the Methodists who've taken the responsibility of man. And this is very precious to their heart. And so we find that the whole denominational spread in this land of ours has been over some emphasis of the scripture. Well, these things, if the Bible teaches the sovereignty of God, and it does, doesn't belong to the Presbyterians. It belongs to the Lord and his people. If it teaches the responsibility of man, it doesn't belong to the Methodists. It belongs to the Lord and his people. Do you see? And yet we've had these crystallizations of truths around a fragment of truth that's divided the body of Christ until we have this 312 groups that now are around us and very much part of us. Uh, Bob Finley was here a few years ago and told of his experience up in Chongqing, China. How that there he met a man, obviously a believer, and he went to him and said, uh, by the way, I, I gather you're a Christian, are you? And the man said, I'm not only a Christian, but I am a Missouri Synod Lutheran. Well, now, uh, Mr. Finley said, uh, what, pray tell, business did the Missouri Synod have in making its stamp on someone who spoke the Chinese language up in the very heart of China? Nothing wrong with the Missouri Synod Lutheran, but you see what has happened is then we've exported all of these and all the confusion that it, that it raises. So we've got these two errors. These two things. The one is the meeting around a fragment of truth, and we get that fragment in front of us instead of the risen Christ who is himself the embodiment of all truth. And the second is the clergy, which have had to take the place of what the head of the church wanted to do through every member of his body. And out of these, uh, these two things has grown the, the weakness that we're facing. We're losing the race against time. We're, we're losing it in, on every front, if you please. But... Uh, uh, we keep hoping and praying that sometime we're going to come back to give the Lord a chance to demonstrate again the glorious power that is resident in our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the answer to this great apostasy, this, this falling away that has resulted in our leaving him and gathering to a fragment of doctrine? And instead of being to him what he wants to be, uh, making our own arrangements, what is, what is the answer to it? Well, we find today that the answer that's being proposed by the, by the World Council of Churches is an ecumenical, a political ecumenical union that is going to mean the ultimate control of all of these groups by some fiat of governmental enforcement so that all the 312 groups will ultimately have to come under one head and we can then be Christian again. You understand that uh, Pope John, uh, shortly after his accession, uh, as uh, the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church called for an ecumenical council. It's been rarely done. I think the previous one was in the middle of the last century. It's been some hundred years. Three things are being presented at this time, we're told. We're in the Herald Tribune a while ago. First, the Mass, after if the intent of this council is carried out, after it's done, 
the Mass will always be rendered in the language of the people rather than in Latin. Secondly, priests will be able to marry, especially the deacons and those who do not wish to go on to the higher echelons of church responsibility and administration. And the third thing that is being proposed to this ecumenical council is that the Pope will be elected no longer by the cardinals, but by the archbishops, 11 uh, being the number, but uh, the archbishops of the Syrian church, the Orthodox church, Romanian and Serbian and so on, will, will elect the head of the role of the church, uh, but he will be elected from the cardinals. This is a tremendous concession from a world uh, religious point of view. It was sent up, I think, as a trial balloon. There's been no one that's taken any exception to it. And so probably this will be the effect of the ecumenical council that's called for next year. And we, you heard just a while ago Eugene Carson Blake and Bishop Pike on television who said that uh, the union of the four great denominations was just the first step in the ultimate union of all Christendom. You see, when I see something like this happen and see all this excitement, all I can think of is that uh, this is a faith, this is a sort of a, a distraction on the part of the enemy to get our minds off of what the Lord is doing. Now you recognize that in all denominations, there are multitudes of people that are just nominally members, not just through the Roman Catholic, but it's through the Baptist, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, the Alliance, through all of us, nominally members. I've had some little interest, and then the interest lapsed and waned, and they're no longer to be found. And their names are there, and they're counted in all the statistics, but nevertheless, they're not personally participating. And it seems, therefore, that this ecumenical movement that's so obvious, that's so political, so material, so organizational, is, if I can use the word, a thing to get our minds off of the real thing the Lord is doing. There is something that he's doing. I think it began back 80 years ago, right here, with this church. If you were to ask me to name one of the most historic dates in the, since the time of Martin Luther, I would say it was that Sunday that A.B. Simpson met with seven people down here on 23rd Street, where he had an entirely new, biblically new concept, a concept of meeting no longer around some fragment of doctrine, not even around the fourfold gospel, but it was Christ, only Christ putting the Lord Jesus back in the center. And it was to be a people of all different groups. They met Sunday afternoon so that the Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterian could come to some neutral place, other than right here at this point, but around the country. They met meet in the women's club, in the YMCA. They meet in the neutral ground so that people could come without prejudice and have their hearts fed. He didn't want to start a denomination at all. He wanted people to come, to be nourished, to be strengthened, and sent back to their own churches as fifth columnists for the spiritual life. There to live Christ and witness and preach so that they could be the means of blessing. And so the concept that he had that motivated the movement was distinctly new. Something that we do not find expressed or proclaimed elsewhere. But of course, again, there again in the erosion of time, you have that process we've talked about. Until today, the genius is somewhat obscured by the mechanics of our present responsibility. But I firmly believe, dear heart, that the Lord is moving in this day to answer the great apostasy on the part of the spiritual, on the part of those that love him. For we find everywhere around the country that the hungry are finding each other. Baptists are meeting with Presbyterians, and Presbyterians finding delightful fellowship with Episcopalians. And Episcopalians are rejoicing that they are being helped and encouraged along the way by the Methodists. And the Pentecostals are finding that they can sit down with the others and uh, the sheep can eat with the lions and they can have blessed fellowship together in the things of the Lord. And there's, there's been a, a marvelous new thing happening, even in the very present hour. And we find that the hungry are finding each other. Now I believe this is, this is a, just the first little indication of what the Lord is going to do for his own. I believe that we're going to see two things working concomitantly. The first is going to be the ceaseless increase of ecumenical power. You've heard me expatiate on that. That this is an insult to intelligence and the kind of a world that's represented by the building at the other end of 44th Street in the United Nations will no longer countenance a Christianity that's divided into four, five, or six hundred different fragments. And so the process is going to be organizational, political, ecumenical union. But at the same time, there is going to be, and there is now, this increase of personal fellowship on the basis of individual believers that find fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ and are, are brought into a place where they share the same hunger and the same delight and the same blessing. 
It's happening now. And out of it then, the strategy of the enemy is going to be for, I think, to some degree nullified, because we're beginning to realize that there is a true biblical spiritual ecumenism. And it isn't on the basis of organization, it isn't on the basis of membership, it's on the basis of our meeting around the Lord Jesus Christ on the basis of his word, and not a doctrinal derivation from his word or an extraction from it, but we meet him on the basis of this. It's simple, it's clear, and I believe it's understandable, and hearts everywhere are responding to it, evidenced by the tremendous increase in groups, hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds of groups, starting all across the country, that have no recognition of denominational lines, the only thing that qualifies one for being part is a hunger for the Lord, a desire to know him and to go on into all that he has for the, us. This, I believe, is the Lord's answer to this organizational ecumenism, where an individual discovers that his heart has a corresponding hunger with someone else's heart, and so they begin the fellowship together in prayer, a meeting in the Word. I've had a testimony of one of the people of this congregation who said that they had wanted to have from among the membership of the group. You've heard me speak about this at such length in the past, how I've tried so hard to get groups going. Well, I'm beginning to realize that this is something the Lord is sovereignly doing. Because she said, well, there was a person from another, from a Baptist church and from an Episcopal church and someone that's come from another church. And the four have been meeting, strangely drawn together by an accident. And yet they find they're sharing the same interest and burden and hunger, and they're fitting it into their already pressed and busy schedule. No, dear heart, I believe that this is the great apostasy, this meeting around an extraction from the word that obscures the blessed Lord Jesus Christ and allows people to come into an organizational relationship that do not have a vital living relationship with him. That all of this is going to be gathered up. It's the tentacles are reaching out even now, pressing and drawing. And as this is drawn off that way, then the Lord by the Holy Spirit is going to draw this way. And there in such groups, without any plan, without any listing, without any membership and then any statistics, I believe we're going to see the release of the Spirit of God. The power of God made manifest in our communities and made manifest in our homes and perhaps even to some encouraging degree in our churches. So has the great apostasy come? In the opinion of the one speaking to you, it has. And that it was the strategy of Satan back there 1600 years ago to get Christianity to organize around fragments taken from the word of God and so to obscure the blessed head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is this going to continue indefinitely? I think not. I think the time has come when the ecumenical pressure on the outside is going to correspond to the inward pressure of the Holy Ghost as he causes those of like precious faith to find each other and to share together in their hunger one for another. And it encourages me, therefore, to pass this word on to you and to ask you, how real is your faith? Are you just loyal to a church, a building, a, a statement of doctrine, a fragment of truth? Or has the Spirit of God done something so transformingly wonderful in your life that you are finding others of similar heart, similar hunger, similar birth, and you're sharing together with them, because deep is calling unto deep, and you have an inward spiritual recognition of those of light, precious faith. Is this so? For you will find hunger everywhere. You'll find it on every hand. I close with the experience, and I'm sure you've heard it before, but what can I say after six years that somebody hasn't heard before? When dear Tom Hare died there in Chicago, or I mean not died, was in that fire in the Chicago, and, the, and Leonard Ravenhill found it necessary to drop him out of the fourth floor window to the paved alley behind, and he was so broken. He went into a Catholic hospital there on the south side near the Alliance Church where Dr. Tozer was pastor so many years. And the first when he regained consciousness, for he was unconscious for several days, a nurse was there saying her rosary. And he said, oh, sister, I'm grateful to you for praying. Oh, she said, all of us have been praying. We've been saying many prayers for you. Well, he said, come here, and he reached his hand out and took her, and he says, now you say a prayer for me now. And she started one of her learned and formal prayers. He said, now pray in your own words. And she said, I don't know how. He said, well, then I'll pray for you. And so he began to pray and thank the Lord that the sisters had ministered to him and cared for him and prayed for him. And she went away with tears in her eyes. And every time he rang the bell after that, another sister came. And every time they came, they'd say, now will you say a prayer for me? And so he would. And he, every, every time, if he had three glasses of water in an hour, he had three different ones bringing it to him. And they all wanted to have someone to have him pray for them. 
And one day after he'd been there about a week, a Monsignor from down at Notre Dame came in. The uh, head of the church of the uh, hospital uh, uh, came, Mother Superior, she came in and uh, introduced him and said, this is Monsignor so-and-so and he's asked to see you. The door was closed. He said, don't disturb us until I come out. And then he turned to Brother Harry. He said, the rumor has gotten all around the diocese that there's a Protestant saint here in the hospital. And hearing about him and what he'd done and how he prayed, I just had to come and see you. And then he sat down on a chair beside Brother Hare's bed, and he began to tell how he was a boy, uh, deeply aware of his need and greatly convicted of his sin. And he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. He told of the revelation of Christ to his heart, how he knew his sins were washed away, not by ceremonial observances, but by the work of the Holy Ghost, witnessing to his heart that this blood of Christ is a veil. And then he told of his great burden for his people. He said, I'm so concerned for my people because so many of them come to confession and they have no intention of giving up their sin. It's just a rote. It's just a ritual and it isn't real in their heart. And I fear for many of them that they'll never see him who died for us. And he told of his hunger to know the Holy Spirit in his fullness. He told of his deep desire to be all that he knew the word of God said he should be. And then when he'd finished this and Brother Herod spoken something of his testimony, he turned the tears in his eyes and he said, I see, Mr. Hare, that you are a saint. And then he said, will you pray for me? And the Monsignor got down beside the bed and uh, Brother Hare started to pray, a little bit awed by this. And he said, oh, no, no, put your hands. You told me you've been a plumber. He said, put your hands on my head. I've had the hands of archbishops. I've had the hands of the leaders of the church on my head. But he said, nothing has ever really come from it. He said, I want you to put your hands on my head. And so he took those two hands that had been toiled around a pipe wrench and around the plumber's trade, tools of the plumber's trade, and he held them with his hands on his head as Tom Hare prayed for him. And then when he left, he said, you know, the higher you go, the more obscure the fences between us seem. He said, the nearer you come to Christ, the less important all these things that separate us are. You say, well, how could that be? Well, I don't know. It's just that God has his own everywhere. And when I read Madame Guyon, and I read Archbishop Fenelon, and I read uh, John of uh, Roysbrook, and Meister Eckert, and Francis of Assisi, I find that there's an order of fellowship of the burning heart. And I believe that this is the ecumenism of the Holy Ghost. And this is what he's doing, as he's finding individuals of, of like precious faith, quickened by the Spirit of God, with a hunger for the Lord. And this is God's answer to that great apostasy. Does this mean that something has to happen before the Lord comes? I see nothing. I see no prophetic thing other than the preaching of the Gospels of the last tribe that has to be fulfilled before our Lord comes. I, as far as these things are concerned here, personally, it's my own opinion that there is sufficient evidence that they've been fulfilled. If I see any reason why our Lord delays, it's this, that he can get some who love him with all their hearts and are seeking him with all they have that will become to him the vehicle by which he can reveal how wonderful the Lord Jesus is. But this fellowship that's going to be a vehicle for the risen Christ is not going to be on the basis of some fragment of truth extracted from the book, but it's going to be because there have been those that have gathered to the Lord Jesus Christ and they've accepted the word, they've just taken it and not some extraction from it, and they've met him and they've met with others that love him similarly and have thus become a, a channel through which the Lord Jesus can reveal how wonderful he is. And so, brethren, I see very little hope at all in the ecumenical movement as such. I see nothing there except this, that there are some hungry people there, and some that are desperately hungry. Bob Walker, my friend from Chicago, the editor of Christian Life, was on the train into his office in Chicago, when he sat down next to a young man reading the Bible and found out that he was the head of the Methodist youth work and was the international, the world head for the youth organization for the Methodist church. And as he began to converse with him, the man told how he'd come to know and love Christ, how he'd been born again. And he said, you know, Mr. Walker, my heart is so hungry for what John Wesley wrote about. I'm so desperately hungry to know the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And he said, our people, they're just blind, leaders of the blind, how greatly they need to know him. And so they began to keep in touch with one another. And there came a time when this man got in touch with Mr. Walker, and he said, oh, I know now, I know now. And it was through, not Methodists, but through some Episcopalians and some Presbyterians that the Lord had led this young youth worker into a full relationship with Christ. And so he'd been now prepared to minister. And so you'll find everywhere the hungry. There's only one question. Will others that come find hunger in you? 
Will there be a response in your heart? Do you long for him and long to have fellowship with others who know and love him too? This is the question. Or has there come to you such a blind loyalty to some extraction of truth? For I speak to many that are not of this group. That you say, well, if they're not uh, of our ism, then I can't have any fellowship with them. Oh, I don't believe for a moment that we should become part of any of these movements. My great concern is that we should be in the very center of what the Spirit of God is doing in the hearts of those who know and love him. What about you? Have you been victimized by the great apostasy, or have you risen above it and passed it and through it? And you see that our fellowship is not on some little extraction of truth, but on the word of God and with the living word, the one who is himself the truth, our Lord Jesus Christ. And anyone who knows him and loves him and searches, longs for him similarly is one with whom you can have on that level of fellowship in Christ, fellowship with them. I believe this will give God something with whom which he can work in our greatly needy day. Shall we bow in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we've been victimized so through the centuries. Our hearts ache when we realize the great expenditure of money and time and effort in perpetuating things which are better if they'd have disappeared, loyalties that have lost their meaning. We can see something of the rationale and pressure behind the ecumenical movement. Father, we see so little there that offers any answer to our day and generation. In politics, in organizations, in all of this, we do believe that when two or three are gathered to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they haven't just taken some little fragment from the Word, but they've just come with an open book to the risen Son, risen Christ. There thou art in the midst of them, and there thy glory can be revealed, and there thy blessing can be released. O oh, Father, in this day, save us from being victimized by this great apostasy we see on every hand, this sectarian spirit, this division of mind and heart that has caused people through the years to have suffered such animosity and hate, even hatred at times. And give to us, we pray now, such an overwhelming hunger for the Lord Jesus, such a love for everyone that's been born into the Father's family, for such a desire to be all that thou wouldst have us be and share all that thou hast given with everyone that's interested, that there shall come a sense in which we're living in the very midst of miracle and that each day is an unfolding of thy glorious plan for our lives. We pray for, thank thee for those here in this company that have found their hearts stirred with a great desire and longing for thee. We thank thee for those whom thou hast met and thou art meeting. And we pray, Father, that the original vision that made this church uh, uh, have a place in the community shall be reestablished here. And that because of the dynamic of this vision, that there is a fellowship for all that are in Christ. And that they can go anywhere thou wouldst lead them and carry the blessing of the fullness of thy presence with them. That this shall be reestablished. And that there shall flow out from this a center of testimony and truth that can bless the entire community. Yes, as it has in the past in increasing measure blessed the world. And so to that end, give us insight, give us understanding, give us illumination, but above all, give us hunger. For if we've outlived our hunger, we've outlived our usefulness. And grant to us then in this day to offer the alternative to organizational ecumenism, the true ecumenism of the Holy Ghost, as hungry hearts find that they can talk with us and we can share with them of the fullness of Christ. And so to that end, seal even our thought and our meditation tonight, and gather, we pray thee, in these days when sin increases and abounds, and Satan's strategies all seem to come to their focus. Gather to thyself a people through whom thy great strategy of releasing the, or revealing the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ can be fulfilled. When we have some part in this, Lord, oh, we, we long to see the glory of thy Son unveiled. And we ask thee that there might be such a joining of heart to heart tonight that this can take precedence over all lesser interests and that thou canst truly have what thou dost want from us. We ask for those that may be among us that know not our Lord, might something be said to show how wonderful he is, and they'd want to stay and talk and pray further. And for those who do know him, might there come a great interest and concern to share with others all they've received of Christ. In his name and for his sake we ask it. Amen.